Blessed, you can replace the word happy for the most part, and you'll, you'll be able to unlock the code on what Jesus is trying to say. All kinds of theories around about what, what the key to happiness is. You hear people speculating in songs and so forth. Uh, I remember James Taylor back in the 70s. The secret of life, he said, is enjoying the passing of time. He doesn't have a plan for once time ends. That's the only glitch in the plan. Uh, if you were a big Peanuts fan, you remember Linus? Linus? Happiness is a warm blanket. Boy, life's pretty simple if that's the case. Faith Hill had some song, Happiness is a Good Cup of Coffee. Wow. Just buy that woman a percolator and she's set for life. John Lennon, Happiness is a Warm Gun. Interesting. Kind of like the blanket, except it's a gun, which you can't heat in the microwave if you're trying to make it warm. It does not work. I do not recommend that. Uh, you remember this one from early 60s? If you want to be happy for the rest of your life, never what? Make a pretty woman your wife. Well, I blew that one. <laughs> Guys, this is the time to turn to your wife and say, yeah, I really blew that one. Not, not the time to say, I followed that well. Because then you'll be unhappy the rest of your life at that point. All kinds of theories. 2,000 years ago, this young rogue of a Jewish rabbi comes on the scene and says, everything you ever believed about happiness in this life is wrong. I'm going to say the exact opposite of what you believe. And so Jesus began his ministry, Sermon on the Mount, with the eight Beatitudes, as you see depicted on eight paintings up here. Today's makes no sense, as it did not to the listeners. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Especially if you know that the word Jesus used for poor in spirit kind of didn't just mean, it didn't have anything to do with poverty financially. Poor in spirit. Blessed are the beleaguered the miserable, the wretched, the beaten down people. Blessed are you. Huh? How are we blessed? They're at the edge of the crowd. They, they're not allowed to join with the other kids. It's like, blessed are you because yours is the kingdom of heaven. Once you reach that state where you realize, I can't do it by myself. I need help. Aha. Aha. Now you're ready to move on. As we see depicted in our kingdom of heaven painting by Leo Knapper back here. Looking out through a dark world at the... The kingdom of heaven beyond. Blessed are you. The kingdom of heaven is yours if you get to the place where you realize you need a savior. Kind of simple in a way, and yet it goes against our human nature because I don't want to admit that I'm not wrong. I'm encouraged all the time to be on top of things, to be in charge, to be the, have the reins on my destiny, and it goes against everything I believe in. 12-step people understand this very well. I'm the coolest Christians in the world I've ever met are 12-step Christians because you understand. Uh, my friend of mine was a, a lifelong 12-step guy. He was at a meeting one time where everyone was going around talking about, you know, their struggle. And this new guy, new guy had never spoken. I said, new guy, you want to tell us what your deal is? He goes, my name's Jim. I guess I'm an alcoholic. I'm like, what do you mean you guess you're an alcoholic? Well, I hear your stories. You guys, you know, you wrecked your car and you lost your job and, you know, your wife ran out. And you said, I mean, I, I'm I drink every day, yes, but... Okay, I get drunk every day, but I, I'm, I'm holding down my job. I mean, I'm sensible about it. I'm not, you know, trashing my life. I'm not. And everyone in the circle just looked at him, wondering what's the next move. So the leader of the group stands up, reaches in his pocket, pulls out a $20 bill, and he goes, here you go, pal. He goes, what's this for? He says, go buy all the liquor you can buy and get hammer drunk. It's like, isn't this an AA meeting? I wasn't expecting that. He's like, well, yeah, but apparently you're not ready. You haven't been drunk enough. You haven't had your face in the gravel enough. You haven't trashed enough things in your life to be ready to reach out for help. So you're not really ready for this meeting. And out the guy walks with a $20 bill. Might be a good way to make money if you're down on your cash. Show up at AA meetings and say that. I don't know. 
But, but they understood well. They understood, well, you're not ready. If you feel like you still are on top of things, I still got control of everything. Oh, Jesus says that's not a good place for you. Until you recognize your need for a Savior, what's it going to take in your life to get you to that place where you're reaching out, reaching out for the Savior? Well, there's actually three kinds, I think, three kinds of sins, three kinds of sinners, and you can recognize yourself in one of these three groups. The first one are the instant karma kind of people, to borrow a word from Eastern religions, because it's just a phrase we use, instant karma. This, not necessarily the second you do it, although sometimes it's the second you do it. It depends on how young you are. When you're 13, you do some thir- instant karma things. I'm going to see how close to my ear this firecracker, ow! Instant karma, flashes right back at more, more times than not, it takes maybe a few days, a few weeks, maybe even a few months before it blows up. But it blows up fairly quickly, and you should, should instantly recognize, I'm not good at my decisions. Should. Some of you are remembering your teenage years, maybe your 20s, and some things are coming to mind. Great verse of Scripture, Proverbs 22, 5. Thorns and snares are in the paths of the wicked, or the way of the wicked. Whoever guards his soul will keep far from them. Two kinds of people in that verse. One guy is going down the path where there's clearly huge thorns he's fighting through. Ow! Getting scratched all over. And snares. He's falling in big bear traps that are clapping on his shin. And some other guy's keeping, okay, mental note. Yeah, I don't want to do that. It's like, dude, why are you going down this path? You're getting all scratched up. You're getting banged up. You're getting caught in snares. Oh, no. <laughs> My friends are doing it, I guess. Like, whoa. Have you ever been that dumb? I'm a. I hate to tell you this, but I'm from that camp, the instant karma camp. It, and Jesus says you're actually at an advantage because you recognize quickly. I read about these guys. Selena, Kansas, trailer park. Two 18-year-old stoners are looking out their trailer window when they're smoking it up, and they're looking out the window, and they see two cops coming down their street. Like, dude, the popo, the 5 we got to get rid of our stuff. So they start go to the, the back window of the trailer, and they're flinging bongs going out the window and pipes and Ziploc bags and potted plants flinging out the window. Two things they didn't realize. Thing number one, from where the cops are walking, they can see all of a sudden potted plants with those distinct jagged leaves. There goes a bong, there goes some pipes and Ziploc bags. Well, and the cops walk over and I'll see all this drug paraphernalia as well as the drugs outside. So they go to the trailer and you're under arrest. You have the right to remain silent. Ah, dude, how'd you know? The worst part about it was the cops weren't after them. The cops were trying to serve a warrant on somebody two doors down. You boneheads, you. There's no shortage. There are huge volumes, hundreds and thousands of stories of dumb people who engage in instant karma sins. Ow, that didn't work out. Wow, that really was stupid. And you make the paper. <laughs> and your video gets lots of hits on YouTube for your stupidity. So that's the other benefit is Stupid makes for a good story. I hate to tell you that, but I'm telling you, some of the best stories, I don't know what I was thinking at the time, but, oh, this is going to be a good one. Okay, those dumb people always have way more stories than the sensible people. Okay, maybe that's not right, but it's true. You may notice I've got a lot of stories. Okay, Uh, but the other benefit, the much more important benefit, Jesus says, now, the quicker you realize you can't do it yourself, the dumber you are with your decisions, the quicker you're going to realize, I need a Savior. This is a good thing to get to that place. It's the best thing of all to get to that place. But until you're that dumb, you're not going to realize it. Now, you may be one of those sensible people. Maybe you're one of those kids in high school that I was always jealous of that always were level-headed and never overindulged in anything particular and always kept and were always the designated drivers and were always like... And it's like, you may look at the boneheads... And think, why do you get advantages, man? I did things right. I was uh, recently on Route 29, and get this, there was road construction going on. Can you believe that? So what was normally two lanes of traffic at rush hour was now just one, and so the orange cones and merged to the right. So I go, okay, fine, whatever. So I get in my line, 100 cars ahead of me waiting for the, the bottleneck. And then there were the twits. The three twits who decided the rest of you should have to wait in line, not me. I'm special. I want to get to work really fast, unlike the rest of us. And so we're going to be up at the top, right at the bottleneck. Hey, hey, can I come in? Hey, hey, can I come in? I didn't want to wait, but can you let me in? And I want to just tap out some message in Morse code to all the 100 cars. Do not let those twits in. Do not feed their bad habit, but I can't figure out a way. And so I'm like, fine, I do it right, and you get some advantage because you get to zoom up there. And it was at that moment I think, 
Oh. Now I think I know what it feels like if you're a level-headed person and you never do anything outrageous and then you look at the boneheads who come in and have all their good stories at testimony time and get in the kingdom same as you. That must be what it feels like. Which kind of leads to the second level. The second level of sinning is the delayed reaction kind of people. I'm not going to do anything outrageous or flamboyant. I'm going to think of sneaky ways to sin. I'm going to make little comments to people that send them off into a low self-esteem or run away with some eating disorder. I'm going to make do a little cheating on the side, a little fudging behind the scenes, a little covert actions. That's what I'm going to do. Because <laughs> I know there's supposed to be consequences for sins, but I think I figured this system out. I don't know if there is or not. Heard of another story. Uh, a guy named Albert Dowdy was in the news. And if you hear the story, he kind of deserved to be called Albert Dowdy. But Albert Dowdy's at a, a local motel and gets bored and thinks, I'm going to go prowling through the neighborhood. Maybe there's something I can find. And he passes this house that apparently has nobody at it. And he's like, hey, I could break in there and get something. <laughs> so he goes up these sliding glass doors looking in there, you know, knocks even nothing. So he sees this can of paint on the porch. And I'm going to break the glass for this can of paint. So he starts banging on the glass with the paint can, and it doesn't break the glass. Instead, the paint can bursts open. <laughs> this whole glop of, of wet paint comes, oh, man. But smart Albert, he figures out a way to get in that house, and he makes his haul, and he gets away. Ha, 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 ha. Cops come on the scene. Okay, we had a break in here, and somebody stepped right in the puddle of paint. So they follow the footsteps of the paint. Some investigations are easier than others. And they follow... Come up to the hotel, room 103, blah, 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 you have the right to remain silent. Now, of course, that was, in reality, that was one of those instant karma things. But the metaphor there, you see, think allegorically. A lot of you think you beat the system. I didn't do anything really crazy. I just kind of was sneaky about it. And you don't know there's footprints following. Great passage of scripture that makes me think of that. The sins of some men are conspicuous. The sins of some men are obvious in 1 Timothy 5.24. Going before them, to, even before they get the instant explosion. There's your instant karma sins. But the sins of others appear later. It leaves a trail. NIV says, the judgment for that one trails behind you. You think you've got the system beat and you think no one's going to know this. And you've got these footprints of paint following you that eventually will catch up to you. It will catch up to you. You may think, you pulled a fast one on God. He's getting really old. There's supposed to be some bad consequences for this sin, but ha, ha, ha. I think I pulled it off. There will be some judgment on this one, and it's going to take you longer to realize your need for a Savior. But that's how we think. That's how we operate. It's not going to catch up to me. Fun, fun, fun. Let's all have fun. Come on. Why is God coming down so hard on fun? We think of Woodstock, the three-day festival from 40 years ago that was just like, oh, man, it's just peace and love. Man, it's just half a million young people just grooving on the earth and, and peace and music. What could be wrong with that? Well, after three days of Woodstock, the founders of the festival were $1.3 million in debt because all the peace and love hippies snuck in without buying a ticket. Most of them did. And so now they're extremely in debt. There were 5,000 injuries during the three days of Woodstock. See, you never hear about that. There were 800 of those 5,000 injuries were drug-related, especially the brown acid. Stay away from the brown acid. And there were eight miscarriages during the three days. or One death. Just never hear about that. All kinds of broken glass injuries of barefoot hippies. It took $100,000 for the organizers to pay Yasger to clean up his farm with bulldozers, piling all this garbage, garbage, garbage into a big pit, and then doing what? Then burning it. Yay, atmosphere. Yay, environment. Okay, the burning of the garbage after Woodstock. And the workers had to go away at the time, no money to pay them, just enough money to get them home after two weeks of bulldozing and cleaning up. And nobody ever hears about that part of things. And that's where God resides. God's like, after the whole fun, after the party's over, I'm the one doing cleanup. Why is God so dogmatic about these sins? Because he's the one doing cleanup on you, see? You don't see that side of things, but God sees it. And he said, you're going to have to trust me. If you think you've somehow wormed your way out of results, you have not wormed your way out of judgment. It will come to you, and I'm trying to keep you away from that. We say things like, oh, come on. You know, young men say, boys will be boys. i got to get what's mine, man. There's a world of women out there. I must sample the smorgasbord. And so guys go out with this attitude thinking, come on, come on. It's just perfectly natural. And God says, yeah, I'm the one cleaning up your mess. I'm the one listening to the 15-year-old sob herself to sleep after her 
older boyfriend bullied her into her first sexual encounter. Yeah, but you're having a good time. You don't see those sides of things. We say, oh, come on, parte. It's I'm young, man. Life is for the grabbing. Cinco de Mayo. I got to parte. What's wrong with that? And so we all see the fun side, and God's like, and I have to work the cleanup. I'm the one that's with the parents in the bedroom when they get the call from several states away of their junky homeless son in an alley somewhere lying in his own vomit wrapped in newspaper. I'm the one that gets to hear that part of it. But all we could get was, woohoo, where's the judgment? Come on. Delayed reaction. A lot of people nowadays, you hear people saying, average Christian, say, come on. Porn, everybody looks at porn. There's actually a song from a Broadway musical, Avenue Q, called The Internet is for Porn, would you believe? That's how mainstream this has all become. So come on, what's the big deal? What's the big deal? So you're a 13-year-old, what's the big deal? Looking at all this stuff, because you have acquired a taste for variety. I've never quite figured out why the world of women aren't more enraged at what pornography does to men over a period of decades. Builds in you a taste for variety. There is no woman in the world can be several women, okay? Nobody's ever content with one naked picture. Hey, I have one. No, I don't need any more naked pictures. I have one. I've had it since 1973, my naked picture. It's about variety. And so I was like, come on, kids will be kids. It's, porn. it's just harmless porn. And God's like, yeah, I get to do cleanup. I get to be there in the living room when you explain to your kids why you're not content with their mommy anymore because you acquired a taste for variety back in age 13. And now the delayed reaction is blowing up and these kids are crying and you're having to explain to them why. Suddenly your secretary is hanging around with you and why you're not living at home and why, why, why. And God's like, this is what I'm talking about. It may be a delayed reaction. And for you, if it's delayed reaction sins, eventually you're going to realize, oh, oops, really screwed up there. I really need a savior. Now, kind of a variation on that, I think is the third kind of sin, which I would call the slow starve. The slow starve. These are the hardest people to get through to. The, these are the people who are actually legitimately successful, okay, in what they do. They're the hardest people to convince. Here's a verse from Jeremiah 9. Thus says the Lord, let not the wise man boast in his wisdom. If you're intellectual, if you have a great brain, you have done great things with your brain. It's hard to get through to you. Let not the mighty man boast in his might. You're a great athlete. You've done wonderful things with your athletic prowess. Let not the rich man boast in his riches, Northern Virginia. You have acquired a great income. But let him who boasts, boasts in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who practices steadfast love. You are never going to be satisfied. These things will not satisfy you. Okay, here's a tidbit from the world of iguana care. You woke up this morning and thought, I wish... They had a tidbit at church about iguana care. And so here you go. Um, we had an iguana. We've had lots of pets over the years, more than our small house ever allows for. Sometimes you walk into our house, you think you're in a petting zoo. But we did have an iguana at one point. His name was Gump. And so we bought the terrarium for him. And you have to buy a heated rock for the iguanas. They like doing that. And uh, pretty much just sat there and stared at us. Drove the cat crazy because the cat couldn't reach this, this tantalizing iguana. But um, there was one thing in the iguana care instructions they were very adamant about. First of all, easy to feed your iguana. They're vegetarians. Feed them carrots. Feed them, you know, anything, any kind of vegetables. But do not, do not, do not, absolutely do not feed this iguana lettuce. Don't give lettuce to the iguana. Why? Is it poison? No, it's not poison. They love the lettuce. So, so we should give the lettuce to the iguana. No, 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 no. Do not. Here's the thing with lettuce. Lettuce, once the iguana, he'll eat his vegetables, but once he tastes lettuce, he only wants lettuce. Lettuce! It's like intoxicating. I want lettuce. To the point of once they've engaged, they've engorged themselves in lettuce, they will, only, they will turn down all other food waiting for the lettuce. So we stopped taking our iguana to the salad bar. It just wasn't working out. Lettuce! And they will eventually, over a couple months, starve themselves because I don't want anything else besides lettuce. And I think that describes the slow starve. For you who are, who are successful, but I have this great thing, but I, by the sweat of my back and the, my bootstraps, I pulled myself, and I built this mighty empire, and I built a good career for myself, and I've done good things. I've been responsible. I've been disciplined, and I've done wonderful things. You're starving yourself slowly because you're missing. That stuff is lettuce. Fame and power and wealth is lettuce. Until you get the nutrient of knowing God, it's going to take you a long time 
before you realize, oops, I need a Savior. Which brings us back to Jesus. Happy are you who realize quickly, I can't do this by myself. I need help. I really need help. I really need help bad. In Jesus' day, there was one group he could not get through to. It was the Pharisees. Pharisees pretty much hated Jesus. There was a few exceptions that came over to his side. Mostly sat at the edge of the crowd and just like, I hate this guy. What, why, what's wrong with the Pharisees? Here's what you need to know about the Pharisees. The Pharisees led disciplined lifestyles. The Pharisees were, for the most part, good guys, in public at least. Behind the scenes, they were little weasels. But the Pharisees were wealthy guys, for the most part, too. And Jesus could not penetrate the very successful because they could not realize their need for a Savior. Happy is he who realizes, I can't do it. I've really screwed up big time. Can I get a little help from a Savior? Now you can experience the kingdom of heaven, but not until, not until you realize that. Savior, you see, the whole Savior thing. A lot of people misunderstand Christianity. Savior is not just some Good church word to learn to add your vocabulary when you show up for meetings, okay? It is the word. Christianity is all about Savior. A lot of times we think that, you know, God made this perfect little world, then oops, what happened? There was some manufacturing glitch, and turns out humans sinned, and so, oh, great. We'll have to go to plan B. Now I'm going to have to send God in human form. I'm going to have to send Jesus. That wasn't plan B. It was the only plan. It was all about the Savior from the beginning. People will sin God will save. That's always what it was. In Revelation, it says, and this will blow your mind, before the beginning of the earth, the lamb was slain. What? What does that mean? It means that was always what it was going to be. It was always going to be about the Savior. It's not point B. It's not one of the points of Christianity. It's the entire point of Christianity. It's the song we sing. It's the message we proclaim. It's the reason we're put on the planet is to point people to the genius of the salvation program. Humans will sin. God will save. It's what it's all about. And so, with that in mind, the worst thing we could do, I think, is to strut around like we don't need a Savior. Isn't that weird? The Christians who preach the message of the Savior sometimes are the biggest ones to act like they don't need one. Why are there Christians acting like everything's perfect in their life? That's not a good message. Stop pretending. We know the real truth, okay? Okay. But that's our reputation. Those Christians that act like they're so much better than the rest of us. Let us not act that way. If you're not only being dishonest, you are undercutting the central message of the Bible when you do that. Man needs a Savior, and God saves. So there are really the best response to a Savior. Once you realize you need a Savior, there are, several, there are many responses people give. Let me give three main kind, and hope you'll, you'll see yourself in one of these. When you need a Savior and you really need a Savior, there's different approaches you can take. How do you respond? Okay, I realize. I get it. I have sinned. I've screwed up. I need a Savior. What now? Heard of a, uh, this interesting incident. 99th Street in Portland, Oregon, just a couple years ago. What was weird to the, phone, the fire department was the fact that they were getting phone calls from the neighbors. Several neighbors called, yeah, there's a house burning in our street. Or Is there anyone home? Yeah, they're home but they told us not to call you. Well, that gets the attention of emergency people, doesn't it? So fire trucks show up anyway, and they see people, some very nervous 20-somethings, like with buckets of water, trying to put the water out themselves, and a bunch of neighbors standing around the yard watching with scratching their heads like, How, when did it start? Oh, I don't know, 20 minutes ago, but they kept telling us not to call you. So the firemen put out the blaze, and the cops come on the scene and discover why. There's a whole bunch of potted plants in the basement. A whole basement full of marijuana plants. We're going to put the fire out for us up. Yes, our, our house is on fire, but <laughs> we don't want anybody coming around because we don't want them finding what we have. Now let's take a moment to laugh, those guys on 99th Street in downtown Portland, Oregon. But before you laugh too loud, that might be you. If you've recognized, yeah, I can understand. God, I endorse your platform. I salute you. I think it's a wonderful message. But... Now, I'm not sure if I'm ready for a Savior yet because you're going to come sniffing around. You're going to move some furniture. You're going to toss some things out the window. Yeah, God, I don't know if I'm really ready for that. It's like, no, 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 no. That's not how you respond. When you need a Savior, you need a Savior. Let him come in. He wants what's ultimately going to give you the most satisfaction. He's not this doddering old man who doesn't know about human pleasure. 
Don't be afraid. Let that Savior in. Come on, do what you have to do. Come on in. Another response to a Savior, I heard about this in uh, Sarasota, Florida, a lady named Marjorie Kelly. I love this story. Marjorie Kelly calls again, calls 911, and says, I'm having chest pains. I think I'm having a heart attack. I need an ambulance right away. And then she says, but... I don't want any sirens or any lights. I don't want my neighbors to know that I'm having an ambulance sent my way. I'm like, okay. Well, the EMTs had better things to think about. So they're all racing on their way there, and they just let the sirens fly and the lights fly. And so when they get, you know, down the street, and the, and the lights flashing, you know, all the neighbors are starting to look out their window. Marjorie Kelly comes bursting out her front door. Little Miss Chest Pains here. She goes bursting out her front door in rage. I specifically said no lights and no sirens. And then neighbors look out of the window to see Marjorie Kelly chasing EMTs down the street with a rolling pin. I said, no. It's like, wow, Marjorie Kelly, you don't quite get it. Now, while we're laughing at Marjorie Kelly, beware, because that might be you as well. If you've said to God, God, okay, I recognize my need for a Savior, and I want you to come in, but I'm going to negotiate my terms. Here's the thing. Here's what I'm not doing. I'm also going to do this. And I'm going to maybe just make a little silent affirmation in my head, God. I don't want to embarrass myself in front of people. I don't want to go through some silly ceremony where they dunk me underwater. I know it's in the Bible, but I just don't. So God, here's my terms. You don't get to, you don't get to arrange terms. You need a Savior. This is not the art of haggling here with the Savior. You need a Savior. And so under no condition do you say, I will do this if... It's unconditional surrender. Best response is a story I heard about. Read a book called In Harm's Way. If you World War II buffs are here, if you are, in fact, a World War II buff is what I meant to say, um, you'll recognize this. The last ship sunk by a submarine in World War II was the USS Indianapolis. A couple thousand guys crossed the Pacific to drop off one of the key pieces of the atomic bomb, which then gets dropped in Japan. And they're on their way home thinking, any day now, any hour now, we're going to hear the news that Japan has surrendered. Germany's already surrendered a few months ago. And so, woo, there's like just levity in the air. It's like, finally, this war will be over. And on their way home, one last Japanese sub, just a few hours before surrender, gets this one last ship in his sights and sends a torpedo, which blows the bejeebies out of this ship, goes under in eight minutes. They barely get an SOS off. And now, the guys who survived, about 1,200 people survived the explosion are now on the open seas floating. Those who were able to grab life jackets, some were hanging on to rafts. 1,200 people on the open seas without anybody in the area. And so for five days, these guys float and tell their story. The ones on the outside, dawn and dusk, the sharks would come around and just hear screams of people disappearing into the waters. Those who weren't chewed up by, by sharks and eaten were consumed with thirst. Five days without any good water and surrounded in water as they gradually, ever increasingly waterlogged life jackets bring you lower and lower, trying to hang on for dear life. Some guys just get desperate and start drinking seawater, which on an empty stomach immediately poisons them and kills them, and the guys are dropping. On the fourth day, Sergeant McCoy, Marine Sergeant McCoy, is hanging on to this raft, and one of the guys next to him realizes, I can't take this anymore, and starts to swim away. I think he's just going to swim till he drops some exhaustion and goes under. And Sergeant McCoy was this Marine Sergeant. She's like, oh, I don't know. How. He's barely staying alive himself. But he leaves the raft and swims up to the guy, catches up and grabs him, and against his will pulls him back to the raft. With what last strength was in there? He says, hang on, brother. Come on, just got to hang on. And a few hours later, the guy says, I can't take it anymore, and starts swimming off again. And Sergeant McCoy, who's dying himself, somehow musters up enough strength to go back, grab the guy again 100 yards away, and pull him back to the raft says, we've got to hang on. Well, later on that day, finally, a plane spots all these bodies in the ocean. A rescue ship comes. And after five days, these guys, barely hanging on for life, are finally rescued. Twenty years later, Sergeant McCoy retires from the Marines. He's now a chiropractor working at his house somewhere in suburbia. And he gets a knock on his door now, mid-60s, somewhere in the 1960s. He gets a knock on the door and sees out his window. I don't know who this is. He goes out in the porch. He goes, Hello? The guy says, you probably don't recognize me, do you? He goes, no, I really don't. He said, we hung on a raft together in the South Pacific. And twice I tried to kill myself. And twice you came and got me. He's like, yeah, I do remember you. He said, I just want to say, 
and he can't even finish the word. Thank you. And Sergeant McCoy's wife looks out the window to see two big, burly military guys, arms wrapped around each other, just sobbing in each other's arms. We remember. That's the proper response with Savior. You found me when I had nothing to offer. You found me at my absolute worst. Thank you. The rest of my life, I will hang on to this thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There is nothing. I will embrace you the rest of my life. There is nothing I won't do for you. I cannot say no to you, my Savior. And that's when you've reached the place where you're poor in spirit. And that, Jesus says, now the kingdom of heaven is yours when you've reached that place. Let's pray. Father, I pray that you will all, those of us here today, Father, who have been brought to their knees, I thank you. I pray that you will continue to remind us of, of our saved status. Not that we've earned anything, but that we're saved by your grace. And I pray if there's any that haven't made that decision, Father, that you will humble them, make them realize their need for a Savior. In your son's name I pray, amen.